Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to ELEC 3204. This is a recording for week three, session one. So it's a morning session on Wednesday. Um, so the live lecture did happen, but I forgot to press um, the record uh, button. So the morning lecture wasn't recorded. Um, I will just go through uh, everything again and record it this time. So if you didn't attend the morning session today, uh, you can listen to this. Um, I will still ask uh, questions during lectures, uh, during, yeah, during the lecture. Uh, obviously, there will be no one answering me, but uh, it would be it would be good if you if you follow uh, uh, follow these questions and uh, yeah when I ask questions probably I'll pause a little bit so that you can have a think and uh, uh, the reason I ask questions is that uh, there is something I want to emphasize there so it's really important that you your thinking is uh, following me. Um, okay, so last time we uh, finished on here. This is a uh, uh, BR performance uh, for BPSK over AWGN channel. So this is what you received and uh, you transmitted BPSK signal. And then you have uh, AWGN noise, Gaussian noise. So you don't actually need to do any experiments. You don't need to do any simulations. We know uh, how this curve look like uh, from uh, uh, theoretical analysis. Um, so how do, did we do that? Let's uh, recap. So this figure here is really, really important. It looks a little bit, uh, it looks like it contains a lot of uh, inf information, but let's approach uh, this step, step by step. So first step, we have uh, BPSK consolidation. Uh, one, uh, one point is D, another point is minus D. So you have a half-half chance either transmitting D or transmitting minus D. So can anyone tell me where the decision boundary is? So decision boundary is the middle point here, zero. So if you if you have a AWGN channel, so this is what you received, and X is what you transmitted, and then you have a noise. Um, so X will be either D or minus D, and then after you uh, add noise, if the received signal is here, it lies on the right hand side uh, of the decision boundary. Then we know uh, D was more likely, that was uh, more likely to be the symbol that was transmitted. Um, however, we need uh, two conditional probabilities, which are the probability of transmitting D and then receive Y here or transmitting minus D and then receiving Y here. We need these conditional probabilities so that we can calculate error, error probability, which models uh, the probability of occurrence when error happens. So uh, the second step is the only probability we know is the PDF of a noise which is a Gaussian PDF, right? So it's a Gaussian noise, so it's zero mean, and the Y's is determined by the power of the noise. So this is the only, only probability that we know. So how, how can we use this probability to calculate these conditional probabilities? So that's a third step. We have we have D and the minus D. So what we do is um, we place the PDF at the center of D, 
So this becomes the so conditional probability that D was transmitted. And if we have received signal one in here, the so conditional probability that D was transmitted, but we receive Y, uh, that probability can be read from here because uh, only noise uh, did something, only the noise that corrupted the transmitted signal. So the probability that we receive Y can be read from this uh, noise PDF. And then what is the probability of transmitting minus D and then receive Y? It is to place the PDF as a center of minus D. And then a PDF, a PDF, a Gaussian PDF has really long tail. It would cross over the boundary. And then when you transmit minus D and then receive Y, the probability can be read from here. So this probability is lower than this probability. So this probability is here lower than this probability here. So this symbol was more likely that the symbol that was uh, transmitted. Um, so can anyone tell me what it, how do we calculate uh, error probability? So error happens when the tail cross the decision boundary, right? T0 is a decision boundary. So uh, error probability is the area under the tail. We have half half chance this is transmitted or this is transmitted. So we have half probability multiply this area and then half multiply this area. So we can only care about this area. So let's uh, look at uh, them. Uh, this is a conditional probability. So we have received signal and then transmitted signal and then noise. We only know the distribution PDF of the noise. So actually here y minus x equals exactly equals to n. So we directly use um, the PDF of n to represent the conditional probability where x was transmitted and then y is received. The decision boundary is a middle point. So x1 is minus d, x2 is d, so t is 0. And then uh, the error probability is when we transmit a negative signal, but we receive a positive received signal. Or when we transmit a positive signal, and then we receive a negative received signal. And as I said before, there is half half chance whether a positive signal or a negative signal or positive signal is transmitted. So we only we can only care about uh, this one because the whole thing is symmetric. So we only need this. And this is Gaussian PDF. So we put Gaussian PDF in here and then take integral from zero because zero is a decision boundary. So x1 is minus d. So what it, what it does here is to take uh, the integral, so the area under the curve that cross over the decision boundary. So this is a uh, uh, error probability. And then we want a simpler representation. So normally when we, when we do uh, integral on a Gaussian PDF, there is no closed form, but we use that so much. So we define it as a Q function. So every time we see Q function, we know it's an integral on Gaussian PDF. It is so heavily used 
that if you search in my lab or IT Plus or any programming language that has um, communication lab library, uh, Q function is normally already built in. So Q function is really important. Uh, let's plot the constellation again here. So P here is a power. So we also we use D here because later on we, we are going to use D. But P is a power. So P or minus P are the BPSK constellation points. And then the decision boundary is at zero. So if we observe this equation, we can see that uh, the BR, error probability, is a Q function. Q function as a function of uh, P divided by sigma. P is the distance between the constellation point and the decision boundary. The distance between constellation point and the decision boundary. And sigma is the standard deviation of the noise. Y equals x plus n. So the noise power is n0. If rho part and imaginary part have the same power, then standard deviation is n0 by 2, uh, root square of n0 by 2. This is a standard deviation. Right? So this is a really it become a really simple form. P E equals Q, uh, the distance between constellation points and the decision boundary, and the standard deviation of the noise. And so, so this is a definition of Q function. This is how Q function looks like. And when we actually use Q function to uh, plot the BR curve, this is what we get. This is uh, very important because in communication systems, for example, if I have a target BR of 10 to power minus 5, we know how much SNR we need to achieve this uh, target performance. And uh, this curve is plotted by, by this. So you only need to input uh, actually SNR because here uh, p is the signal power and the sigma is uh, the square root of uh, noise power in either real domain or imaginary domain. So you only input SNR, you only need to know the SNR, and then you get a theoretical uh, BR. So that's BPSK. So we are going to talk about system quam. System quam constellation looks like this. So uh, constellation points they are separated by two D. So D here and then D here. Um, and uh, we have calculated um, the average power. So for system quam, there are three rings. The first ring it has four constellation points. So uh, so sitting quam is always in the form of uh, positive or negative d or 3d for the real part and also positive or negative d or 3d for the imaginary part. So in terms of uh, amplitude, there are three rings. The first ring contains uh, four constellation points, which are associated with uh, D for the real part and D for the imaginary part. The second ring contains uh, eight constellation points, which are associated with either D for the real part, 3D for the imaginary part, or 3D for the real part, D for the imaginary part. And then the largest uh, ring contains four constellation points. Uh, which are associated with 3D for the real part and 3D for the imaginary part. And then if we add them together, 
So four first ring contains four constellation points, second ring contains eight constellation points, and third ring contains four constellation points. We add them together and then take average. We establish the relationship between D and average power. So in this way, we know the minimum minimum distance is 2D, so D here and then D here, 2D. So we know uh, how to represent the minimum distance by average as a function of uh, average power. So we did establish this table uh, to compare star quam and square quam. This is a very important table. So this is Q, uh, Sitting Quam constellation. You, I think you have already learned it in uh, uh, year one, year two. So you really need to master it now. So in the support, supporting document that I told you a few times, um, which is available on the course website, uh, the su supporting document is titled Contracture Amplitude Modulation. So it explains why we have complex value for constellation and complex value for the fading. Uh, and also it details the schematics of system quantum transmission and the receive, uh, reception. So here, uh, this is a real value representation of system quantum. So in general, we have a system quantum constellation, we have real part, uh, sorry, here, real part uh, real part and imaginary part, which is modulated by cosine signal and sine signal, they are also noted to each other. So for the sake of uh, simple representation, we use a complex value. And now as a receiver, we have, uh, so basically if we represent everything like this as a uh, complex value, then we have real part imaginary part for x, and real part imaginary part for y, and real part imaginary part for uh, for, for noise. Um, so you should uh, refer to that supporting document um, to understand why uh, we have that equivalence. <clears throat> so decision boundary, let's directly look at the, the figure here, the figures here. So here we copy uh, the system quantum constellation four times um, because we have four bits. We have uh, we have four bits, and for each bit we will have a decision boundary. Let's recall that for BPSK constellation, we have D and the minor is D. The decision bond, there is only one one bit mapping. So the bit is either uh, zero or one. The decision boundary is in the middle. And uh, this, uh, the BR of uh, this BPSK scheme is Q function of uh, distance divided by the noise standard deviation. So, so now we have uh, four bits. So we copy the consolidation points four times to, to see where the decision boundary is for each bit. And then we need to uh, draw an analogy to BPSK so that we can also evaluate the BR for system quantum. So the first bit uh, here, I1, determines uh, whether the real part is uh, positive or the real part is negative. So uh, on the right hand plane, we can see that uh, all the bit mapping has the first bit being zero. And on the left hand side, we can see that all the constellation points they have the first bit been one. So after we transmit uh, any constellation point, 
if we receive a signal here, then we know that its imaginary part is positive. Uh, sorry, its real part is positive, so the first bit should be decoded as zero. And then the second bit determines whether the imaginary part is positive or negative. So if I, if I look at the upper upper side, we can see that all the second bit, all the constellation points, they have the second bit being zero. If we look at the lower hand, lower side, we can see that all the constellation points they have the second bit being one. So the second bit determines whether the imaginary part is positive or negative. The third bit is a little bit complicated. It determines the scale. So we have Q plus K consolidation uh, of always in the form of positive or negative D for real part or 3D for real part. And then positive or negative D for real part or 3D for the imaginary part. So the third bit determines uh, the scale of the real part if it's either D or 3D. So if we look at the middle area here, we can see that all the constellation points they have their third bit being zero. And if we look at the area at the side here, we can see that all the constellation points, they have their third bit being one. So if we transmit any constellation point, and then we receive something here, we will know that uh, its amplitude is in this area. So the third bit should be decoded as one. And then similarly, it's for the fourth bit determines the scale of the imaginary part. So the middle area here, all the constellation points that have their last bit being zero. And uh, the area of the, of the two sides uh, here, we have all the constellation points, uh, their four speeds, the last bit being one. So now, if we have, uh, I have a question. So if we have a constellation uh, diagram like this, and we have uh, transmitted uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, symbol, uh, we don't know which one was transmitted. But uh, when we receive a signal, the received signal can be placed in here. Can anyone tell me how? Uh, the four bits should be decoded as. So this receive signal is closest to this constellation points. So we all know that it will be decoded as this constellation points. So uh, uh, it, the four bits will be decoded as 0, 1, 1, 1. However, if we look at the decision boundaries, we can make decisions uh, one by one. First of all, when we receive something here, we know that its uh, real part is positive, so the first bit should be decoded as zero. And then for the second bit, the imaginary part is negative, so we know the second bit should be decoded as one. And then for the third bit, as in uh, this area, so we know the third uh, bit should be decoded as one. And then for the last bit, uh, it's in this area. So we know the fourth bit should be decoded as one. So that's how decision boundary help us to uh, do detection step by step. Um, the reason we are using decision boundary here is that we want to calculate uh, BR just in the same way as <coughs> BPSK. So let's recall that BPSK constellation is uh, either D or negative D. 
and then decision boundary is in the middle, which is zero. And the distance between consolidation points and uh, the decision boundary is D. So the BR is uh, D divided by sigma, right? So essentially what we have here is all the consolidation points, they are of different distance to the decision boundary. For example, this one has a distance of D to the decision boundary. This one has a distance of 3D to the decision boundary. So for these two points, they will have different probability of error. So what we need to do is we need to calculate how many consolidation points has a distance of D to uh, their decision boundaries. How many consolidation points have decision 3D to their decision boundaries? And then we replace this by either D or 3D. We use replace, uh, we directly use D or use 3D. And then we take average, then we get a BR. So can anyone tell me in the first figure here, how many consolidation points uh, is uh, of distance D to the decision boundary. So there are eight consolidation points here that are of distance D to the decision boundary. Similarly, in the second consolidation diagram, we also have eight consolidation points to the decision boundary. So can anyone tell me how many consolidation points in here that is uh, of distance D to the decision boundary? The answer is all of them. Because for these eight consolidation points, they are all of distance D to the decision boundary. And for the eight uh, consolidation point here, they are all of eight, uh, all of distance D to the decision boundary. So similarly for, for this figure, we also have 16 consolidation points that are of uh, distance D to the decision boundary. So we add them together, eight, eight, 16, 16. We have 48 of constellation points that, that are at a Euclidean distance D from decision boundary. Now, can anyone tell me for this figure, how many consolidation points are of distance 3D to the decision boundary? So there are eight, uh, this one, this four, and this four. They are all of 3D to the decision boundary. And then <clears throat> the second figure is the same. So we have eight, uh, constellation points, this four and this four, they are all of 3D distance to the decision boundary. Um, so can anyone tell me in this figure how many constellation points we have that are of distance 3D to the decision boundary? This is a tricky one. In the morning, uh, someone answered zero. Uh, there's no constellation that is of 3D to the decision boundary. But it's actually not true because if you look at this constellation point, it is of distance 3D to this decision boundary. So we have four of decision uh, of uh, distance 3D to this decision boundary. And then there's four of decision of uh, distance 3D to this decision boundary. So we have eight constellation points that are of distance 3D to the decision boundary. And similarly for this one, we have these four constellation points that are of distance 3D to this decision boundary. And then these four constellation points that are of uh, distance 3D to this decision boundary. 
So I have eight. So eight, 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 eight. We have a total number of 32 constellation points that are at a Euclidean distance of 3D uh, from the decision boundary. There is another special case. So when you actually, so this is of distance D. So when the PDF here actually cross the decision boundary, there will be an arrow. However, uh, for the third bit, for example, both this side and this side represent uh, the bit pin one. So if uh, this the PDF here cross decision boundary twice, then this area is actually a cor cor probability of correction. So it's not an error. So if you cross decision boundary twice, it is it become correct. So when we calculate the error probability, we need to exclude this uh, scenario. So for this case, uh, the distance between this constellation point and this decision boundary is 5D. <coughs> so can anyone tell me how many constellation points that are of different distance 5D to the decision boundary? So there are four here, and there are four here that are to of di distance 5D to this decision boundary. So eight here. <clears throat> and then similarly, for the fourth figure, we have four constellation points here that are of distance 5D to this decision boundary. And then we have four constellation points here that are of distance 5D to this uh, decision boundary. So I have eight here. <clears throat> so in total, we have 16 constellation points that are at a Euclidean distance of 5D. <clears throat> So now we, we know all the distances. So let's once again recall that for BPSK constellation, we have the constellation of either D or minus D. Decision boundary is uh, zero. <clears throat> and the BR is D divided by standard deviation. So as we said earlier that we have 48 constellation points that are of distance D to a decision boundary. So it's like BPSK. And then we have 32 constellation points that are of distance 3D to their, their decision boundary. So we use this equation, but we replace D by 3D. <clears throat> and we also say there are 16 constellation points that are of distance 5D to the decision boundary. But in this case, this is a probability of correction, so we need to exclude this case. So we minus this. <clears throat> and then we take, we add them together, and then take average. This is a BR of uh, Sixteen Quam. Sixteen Quam. <clears throat> Um, so this is really, really important. Uh, this is only, uh, we, we haven't learned a lot of equations today, but uh, this equation is really important. I expected to be able to repeat it. So how you do it is uh, always draw an uh, analogy to uh, BPSK, to BPSK, and then just calculate how many constellation points that are of different distances to their decision boundaries and then use uh, this Q function, <clears throat> but replace the distance. Uh, add all the occurrence together, and then take the average. So this is a BR. So lines are all theoretical curves that are plotted by Q function. But uh, Q function in Q function, we have D divided by sigma. D will be changed for different constellation points, uh, for different constellation schemes. So for BPSK, it's this one. 
but for QPath K, it will be changed, and for System Chrome, it will be changed to uh, to this. Uh, System Chrome here, we have C1, C2, so they are actually they refer to uh, two cases here. So they, for the first two first two bits. <coughs> The decision boundary di divides the plane by half. So this is like C1 channel for the first two bits because they have the same immunity against noise. And then for the for the bottom two uh, figures, it is C2 <clears throat> because for the for the later uh, two bits, uh, we divide the plane uh, either in real in real domain or in imaginary domain, but uh, <clears throat> so the method is the same, so they have the same uh, immunity against noise. <clears throat> so I have uh, we have these <clears throat> two lines for QPS, uh, so for system system quant, <clears throat> and so all the lines are uh, <clears throat> are drawn based on Q function. So they are theoretical uh, analysis. And all the patterns you see, they are from simulations. So you can see that simulation, they match uh, theory quite well in general. So that's why um, in reality, we don't need to do simulation anymore. We just use Q function. Uh, and uh, we input SNR, then we know uh, what the BR looks like. So now we are going to talk about uh, relay fading. <coughs> <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me. <clears throat> so really fading channel. Um, so for the fading modeling, we have learned that there are three levels of uh, uh, channel modeling. The first level is propagation pass loss, which is a power loss over distance. The second level is shadowing effect or shadowing slow fading, which is a sudden power blockage. Uh, due to building or hills or any environment obstacles in the environment. And the third level is uh, small scale fast fading, um, which is caused by multipath effect because you have many reflected links. Uh, they uh, arrive as a receiver at the same time, but with uh, different phase rotations and different power. Um, so, uh, so for the fast, small scale fast fading, uh, we modeled a small scale fast fading as uh, recent, either recent fading or relay fading, depending on whether there is law of sight. So, uh, um, so we are dealing with uh, relay fading here. So what we received is why. And then if we transmit something here, X, and then there's noise. A really fitting is to have a fading element in here. This is alpha. And the PDF of alpha follows relay distribution. Mm. And then gamma here is the average power of, uh, of this uh, uh, fading element. Um, so normally we assume it to be one, but uh, we keep it gamma here because we are going to do something uh, with it. Um, but gamma is the average power of uh, alpha. So for BPSK constellation, we know that if it's uh, if it's Gaussian, so D, either D or minus D. If it's a Gaussian fading, 
the BR is Q as a function of D divided by sigma. Uh, here we use P, but it's the same. So either D or P, they are the same. Um, so when we actually have a fitting amplitude, the so instantaneous BR is simply to put alpha here. So this is an instantaneous uh, BR. But what we need is average BR. So we need, so this is uh, instantaneous SNR, which is a signal power and the instantaneous uh, fading divided by noise. But what we need is the average power divided by noise. So how, how can we calculate BR as a function of average SNR? What we need to do is to take integral of uh, this uh, PE multiplied by the P dive of uh, gamma, right? Um, but what we know is the PDF of alpha. So here we establish the relationship between alpha and gamma. So eventually what we want is uh, average BR. That is a function of average SNR. So what we do is take integral on the Q function, multiply by the PDF. And here we need to represent PDF as a function of uh, SNR. So we know the re relationship is like this. So we put this into the distri uh, really distribution, which is a distribution of alpha. And then we multiply our normalization factor so that the PDF add up to one. So in the end, we arrive at a closed form. So there is always a closed form when we take an integral of Q function and uh, Gaussian uh, PDF. Um, so closed form is a very simple form that we only need to input the average SNR and then we get the BR. So here we can see this is a performance of Y equals alpha x plus n. So the performance of fading, uh, performance of BPSK in really fading channel is really bad compared to its performance in AWGN channel. So only way to mitigate this is uh, to use multiple antennas. Uh, that's what we are going to talk about in the next session. The next session will be on Friday. Um, so that's all for today. Uh, see you all on Friday.